Good morning, good morning. How do I change my camera settings? I cannot. Okay. So, I'm popping in to say good morning, but I am well aware that it takes some time before I start seeing people's comments because I have lag. Lag makes the world so much more awkward than it already is for people who struggle socially. Not that I struggle socially, but yeah. Is anybody out there? <gasps> Hi, Jacqueline, I'm so excited. <laughs> Just, just to know that the live is working, 11 p.m. in the UK, yes it is. Enjoy your sleep. It's lovely to see you. Thanks for popping in to say hello. Is anybody else awake? It's a really tricky time actually because it's 8 a.m. here in Australia school holidays in Victoria so a lot of families might be sleeping in. Hi Emma, what time is it in Scotland? Oh I've got, yeah, forget I asked that. But it's either really late in the UK or really early here in Australia. Nikki, of course you're awake. Hi. Hi Lisa. I'm a morning person. Definitely a morning person. Hello, Renee. I just had a client from the USA and I forgot to ask what time it is there. I mean, it's going to be different times everywhere, but what, what time is it where you are? Good morning, Chelsea. Where are you coming in from, Chelsea? Where in the world? Hi, Stephanie. It's so nice to connect with people for the first time in a few days. 3 p.m. 3 p.m. is usually my hitting the wall time. 3 p.m. is when my brain starts to shut down and I can't think as well as normal. I've been away for a few days. I haven't been doing any Instagram stories or any lives because I've been a bit unwell. Hi, Rosie. You were mentioning me in a live. Is the PDA Summit on now, is it? Hi, Rochelle. So, Rosie, you've presented already. How did you go? You would have been amazing. Hi, Vanessa. Hi, Anton. Indonesia, fantastic. Wodonga. Chelsea, I grew up in Deniliquin in New South Wales, so spent a lot of time traveling to Aubrey Wodonga. Hi, it's a few people from Scotland. How nice. How wonderful. Um, So I need to sign up for this webinar, the PDA webinar. It'd be fabulous. I'm so excited and so happy that there's something out there for our community. There's so little on offer. Hi, Leanne. Yeah. Ah. The one with me, Renee, with Deb Reba. She's wonderful. Yes, Emma, I have fibromyalgia. And um, one of the tricky things about being a PDA is that we're very determined. You might be a PDA, -er, I don't know. Hi, Amanda. But one of the things about being a PDA -er is that even when I know I've met my limit, 
sometimes the determination forces me to push on forward, especially if it's something I love or I'm passionate about. Hi Susie, I could sing the toilet song. You could just ask Harry for a copy. Hi Mel, you lived in Woomagama. Am I pronouncing that right? Woomagama, a tiny town between Holbrook and Aubrey. Ah, I'm surprised I don't remember that. You do too, fibro. Isn't it awful, Emma? Hi, Rebecca. Normally I don't have flare-ups that often anymore because, you know, I know how to um, look after myself. But, yeah, I've had a fibro flare-up over the last few days. I thought I was getting really sick, but um, just on the couch, migraines, pain all through my body. It's awful. Hi, Christy. I've been on the PDA summit this weekend. One of the speakers said PDA has his roots in developmental trauma. I don't agree with that. So that they were saying that PDA was caused by developmental trauma. That's not what the research suggests that's mm, yeah i think this is something that we hear about often if it was if pda was caused by developmental trauma then it wouldn't be pda it would be autism with trauma um which is what so many people inside of our community take issue with because in much the same way that when um, non-autistic people doubt that people who are autistic and present like me are autistic, then we have the double whammy of having the PDA um, expression of autism and pe autistic people in our autistic community saying, PDA is not a thing, it's just autism with trauma. I think that comes from reading about PDA and identifying the language that's used in their own experience, but it, they're completely different things, completely different things. And a lot of people, you know, ask me, do I think that PDA should be a co-occurring condition? To autism rather than a profile of autism and I don't know I honestly don't know I mean I just want it to be recognized I want I want people to understand that when children with a PDA profile say um, my brain won't let me go to school or my brain won't let me walk through the door or my brain won't let me have a shower i want people to know that they're telling the truth that neurobiological response to our environment is separate from our conscious will and i think something that's really important to recognize is that so many young people with a pda expression they don't avoid school because they don't want to go. They avoid school because their brain has a neurobiological response to it being a cesspool of demands and sensory bombardment and traumatic. Often we want to be there. And yes, Jude, that, that's half the issue the signs of PDA, our expression of PDA. When I, when I present on PDA or when I speak to families about PDA, I will always say the way that our brain responds to our environment is very similar to the way that a brain that has experienced trauma would respond to the environment. But we are born like this. If you ask families when they started to notice that their children were resistant to help or suggestions or taking instructions, 
they will always say very young and there are differences there are definitely differences um, but yeah it, it's such a it's such a difficult thing to to have people believe because we're so behaviorally focused we're so conditioned to look at a thing you know the whole don't judge a book by its cover we don't we can't not do that as human beings because you know our visual sensory system takes in the behavior we look at the expression what's in front of us and our brain interprets it however it will so we become accustomed to seeing behavior and making assumptions about it i'm of the belief that no child misbehaves without a good reason that I don't even really believe in misbehavior I think that all behavior is communication and I don't think any child would want to be disapproved of or you know growled at or punished or have sanctions or restrictions placed upon them in terms of having things that bring them joy taken away um, one of the speakers said developmental trauma and PDA may look the same, but they are not. And there is a way to distinguish this. I'm so glad that somebody said that. Yeah, I want to sign up and I want to listen to the talks, but <laughs> I'm a PDA, so I find it really hard. Part of my PDA is that I, I struggle to, um, you know, read books or listen to other people when I've been told I should. So unless I discover something myself and find it really interesting and follow that autodidactic channel, I find it really difficult, even when I want to. So an example of that would be study. You know, I'm in my grad year of psychology Sometimes I really struggle with it because my brain, my PDA nature, is that it wants to disengage me from what it believes is um, a threat. So it'll scatter my thinking. I won't be able to focus on something because I won't be able to pin down my thoughts. Yeah, I don't think naughtiness is a thing. And I know a lot of people would hear me say that and go, oh, what an idiot. Which is just lovely, isn't it? But yeah i think adults we adults are the people that have the most to learn it's not so much our children you know when we think about the difference between the amount of conditioning we are the most conditioned people adults we've had a longer time throughout our lifespan to be conditioned to think and behave in certain ways whereas children haven't they still show up in the world relatively um, as themselves, intuitively. Good morning, neurotypical, not so much. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not sure what your, what your actual name is, but it's lovely to see you. My next door neighbor has a dog that barks all the time. It's a gorgeous little doggy, it sticks its nose through the fence to watch us playing in the backyard and I go over and give her a bit of a pat. They are giving access to all of the videos on Tuesday. Harry's talk was amazing as expected. What I, what I really love about when Harry speaks is that it's purely intuitive. Hi Alison Holt. I know two Alison Holts. Well, like trauma is caused when the PDA is not recognized and forced to conform to society. Yeah, and unfortunately, hi Claire. I love your profile picture. <laughs> unfortunately, um, 
being tipped over that line into trauma as a PDA is not hard to do. And it's not just about, I hate the thought that families blame themselves. Nearly every family I come into session with who have just discovered that their child has a PDA expression are giving themselves a hard time about how they've done things up until now and how could we do any different? How could we parent any different until we know better? And the thing about PDA parenting is that it has to be intuitive. It has to be child led because we have to come from a space of either trauma or hardship or adversity first. There has to be struggle. Usually with any kind of diagnosis or identification of neurodivergence, there's struggle first. So then we identify that actually the person's brain is different and therefore not aligned with mainstream society. And as we know, mainstream society is largely geared toward neuronormative standards. So everybody is expected to fit into that, especially in the school system. And PDAs, we don't respond well to any kind of restriction, limitation, sanctions. But it's important to know the difference between the person and their conscious thinking and their neurobiological response to the environment. It's not that we're going around deciding to be angry or deciding to never come out of our room and get off our game or making a conscious choice to not go to school. These are all responses when our neurobiology believes it's under threat. Hi Brian, seven stuffed animals on the nightstand. So many autistic people I know love stuffed animals. Kayla is so clever, Claire. So clever and such a brilliant little speaker. I hope everything's okay, Brian. Is there a way to repair past trauma when the PDA isn't recognized until 11 years old? You could ask lots of different people that question and you'd probably get lots of different answers, Jude. My experience for myself, because that's all I can really talk about, is that the trauma is there and it has actually informed the way that I've built a toolkit for myself as an adult with a PDA expression. If you're talking about uh, parenting relationships, they can be healed. I think what's most difficult is us adults and us as parents moving beyond what we've been conditioned to believe in terms of how we should parent children. Mainstream society says we need to be uh, authority figures. We need to keep our children in line. We need to be instilling particular values. And again, when we're parenting PDAs, we try that in a thousand and one different ways. And then we see mental health. We see poor mental health outcomes and we see trauma. Harry, I am so excited that you are here. I was just talking about you. I was saying how I love your talks on PDA because it's intuitive. Who do I think I am? I'm Christy Forbes, man. Check it. I didn't even know you were still doing a live. Um, we were just talking about PDA and trauma and all the goodness. 
all the goody goodness. <laughs> oh, Harry, get over yourself, dude. You love it. I think, um, Harry, this is a really interesting question. I'd be interested to see what you think about this, but no pressure to respond, of course. Somebody's just asked, is it possible to heal the trauma from our past when we're PDAs and we haven't been recognised as who we are until much later? And a lot of people, I hear people talk about the importance of healing trauma. For me personally, and I know this is probably different to what other people would say, I use that trauma as a sacred ally. I use my trauma to inform how I live today. I use my trauma to inform how I parent my little PDA people. Are you still on alive, Harry? Vanessa, that is bang on. Vanessa says, I think the most important thing we can do as parents is heal our own traumas and then show up as present for our kids. I could not emphasize this more. This is something that is so important. When we find it difficult as parents to move through our own conditioning and to be responsive to our PDA children rather than reactive, then we know we've got work to do on ourselves. That doesn't mean that we're bad people. It doesn't mean that we're doing wrong by our children. It doesn't mean that we sit in shame and guilt and regret and remorse. It means that we identify that what we've done didn't work. We tried it. It hasn't worked. And this is really difficult because moving forward means that we have to find a way to shut out, tune out everything we've ever heard about parenting, tune out everything we've ever heard about connecting with our children, relationships with our children. And that takes a lot. It means that we often have to expect loss of people, places and things. And often families will sit in that space of loss for a while. However, when we get beyond that, the gifts are incredible. The ability to live from an intuitive space as human beings is incredible. The ability to create space for the right people to come into our lives is incredible. Because the thing about being a PDA is that we are so highly attuned to other people. We sense people's intentions and motivations from a mile away and we're not going to have people in our space that aren't right for us. As soon as we catch on to something that's not quite right, we create space, we create distance. And it's interesting because we have such little faith in children that when they say, this doesn't feel right for me, or this person isn't right for me, we've been conditioned as adults to say, well, you, you can't know that because you're a child. How can you know what's right for you? But they do. And this is how we set those foundational years for our children to feel like they are valid human beings, to feel that they can set boundaries with confidence. When we spend the first years of children's lives telling them that what they feel intuitively, what they know about what is and isn't good or right for them, is not true unless another adult tells them what's good or right for them we're setting them up for disconnection from themselves from themselves so there's always going to be a sense of questioning whether what they sense about another person is reliable or not and we might have to you know 
as an adult PDA, that meant for me that I had many unhealthy relationships because I was riddled with self-doubt and I had been told that I'm too sensitive and I analyse things too much and I think too much and I feel too much. And so, of course, I went into relationships with other people with that mindset thinking if somebody cracked a joke that felt really inappropriate and really threatening to me, my first thought was, I'm overthinking it. So then the next time somebody put their hands on me or did something else that was largely inappropriate, my thinking was, it's about me. It's not about them being responsible for their actions. It's not about this being an unhealthy relationship. It's about me being too sensitive or me misinterpreting or misunderstanding or not being able to take a joke because I don't have a sense of humour. Autistic people hear this stuff all the time. So this is why it's so important for us to prioritise our relationships with our children and to hear them when they say that person is not right for me. And PDAers, I can tell you right now, I've had an experience with my six-year-old who has gone into a classroom and she loves school. She went into a classroom one morning and there was a substitute teacher in there and she said to me instantly, I'm not going to stay here today because this teacher is angry. Now, I hadn't even heard the teacher speak. I'd never met her before. But what followed in the next minute, in, in the next few minutes was control, exercising control and authority. Why are you sitting over there? Come and sit over here in front of me, please. All the things that aren't important, basically. So she was right. Her intuition was right. And it's so important to tune into that with our children and to honour that. What is going over going bleh, 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 going on over here in the comment section? I've often been heard to say C doesn't trust in me to guide her. When we are told we as the adult should be the anchor for our anxious child when it actually feels better to allow her to trust herself and me to help her feel safe to do this. This is really important, Claire. I love that you've shared that because I think what happens for us as children, if we're PDAs especially, is um, we observe. We do a lot of observation, taking in lots of information through our sensory systems, energy about other people but the information is always there and when we sense that an adult is self-doubting or unsure or has made decisions in the past that hasn't honored how we feel then it's it's not as black and white as losing trust but it's about allowing that adult to shift the focus away from us as children and back onto themselves to look after themselves and their own needs. So sometimes we wait for our parents to grow stronger and for their own relationship with themselves to be more empowered and more solid before we can put our trust in them having the ability to tune into our needs. I hope that makes sense. Learning to honour and trust my children has been so foundational to rebuilding our relationship. Yes, it is the most important thing, Renee. The most important thing. I do have a client soon, so I just have to keep my eye on the time. Yeah, so in terms of... Um, healing trauma trauma is not black and white for the PDA -er. it's not something that happens just because we've had a bad experience 
it also comes about because we've pushed ourselves into environments that aren't aligned with our neurotype as well. So for many of us, we want to learn and we want to be in the school system and I wanted so much to do that. My choice and my will, my free will, I wanted to learn that way. But my neurobiology would not allow me to because it wasn't aligned with how I learn and how I thrive. Hi Nick, I've been wondering how you are. So it was about, you know, we'll go so far into something that isn't aligned with our way of being in the world. And school is a great example. And we're all different, you know, there are PDAs that thrive in the school system when they're accommodated and supported, when relationships are right, when connections are safe and trusting. But for me, um, I tried as hard as I could from a space of conscious thought. I would show up, I would push past my extreme anxiety, I would push past the rage that was inside and I didn't understand the rage but there was a lot of rage inside for me by the time I got to my teen years but that neurobiological response would only let me get so far before I would find myself chronically fatigued or very unwell with autoimmune disease with poor mental health those are the result of pushing ourselves into a system that is not aligned with how we are born to show up in the world. What's happening over here? yeah <laughs> okay so Bree says then how do we get them to do anything around the house or in life in general he can't just sit at home refusing at some point he needs a job to be able to move out etc help so Bree I'm reading your question and I'm hearing desperation but I'm also hearing that conditioning being at the forefront of your thinking and that conditioning creates incredibly debilitating fear in parents it creates a barrier between us and our children that's the mainstream thinking I'm talking about and it's very black and white and very rigid and I understand where that comes from because I started out like that with my own parenting. Um, coming from a space of control and doing all the things that I thought were really important. Now I don't know anything about your personal experience with your child, but I do know this. When our children are resistant to doing those things chores and getting a job it's because we are demand avoidant the language is quite pathologizing you were saying to reduce demand so how do you get them to want to help just normal life skills yeah we don't so when we're working with a child with a pda expression we don't implement those things in order to get them to change that's not the goal here and I know a lot of families come into this space thinking that that's what we do they want strategies they want tools they want parenting approaches that they want to implement with their child but for a PDA that feels um, deceptive and dishonest and we are very attuned to that we'll see straight through that 
we know when something's authentic and when it isn't. And any form of inauthenticity adds to our demand avoidance. It sets off our threat response straight away. So I would suggest that it's more about learning how to be in the world with our children, learning how to find peace and connection with ourselves and with our children. It's not about fixing our children. We're always going to be PDAs. We're always going to be autistic. And probably the first step is to let go of any expectations that you have for your child especially about doing chores and getting a job. That doesn't mean that it will never happen, but we're identified PDA because we are different. There'd be no point in having a diagnosis or being identified as neurodivergent if we were the same as everybody else and could uh, get on board with you know, showing up and living in alignment with neuronormative standards. We can't do that. It's not that we don't want to do that. It's that we cannot. We die inside. Literally, we begin to shut down our senses. The more pressure people put on us, we begin to shut down and it's not by choice it's our neurobiological response it's a lack of feeling safe it's being fed information that we cannot be who we are and we are just who we are we can't be anything other than who we are so there will be stages that we go through. For me, there was violence and aggression and there was, I guess, what people would assume is insubordination. But, you know, when you're a young person and you can't be what everybody else expects you to be, that was painful for me as well. That was largely disconnecting for me as well. Would then society call PDA as ODD? Sometimes, yes. Many people are misidentified, I guess. The problem, the problem here is the rigidity of society. And when you look at the criteria for PDA or autism alone. What you see is a projection of mainstream society fit into a neat little package to describe people who don't fit into that. Most of the time when I come into session with families, they're desperate to know that if they tune into who their children authentically are, if they stop putting demands on them, will their children be okay? Because they are often projected into the future, seeing a 25 or 35 year old adult still gaming in their room. I think we have to redefine what productivity is and success. A person's well-being should be priority. It should always be priority. And I know plenty of adults who still spend hours gaming and we do that because it's regulating and it's soothing and it's calming. And for our children, sometimes a screen is the only thing they have complete control over. Sometimes their only social network is on the other side of a screen. So again, when parents are panicking about screen time, it's because they're tuning into mainstream information about screens being bad for everyone. How can you ever take a piece of information and apply it to every human being? 
I mean, we're just completely dismissing science in doing that. We're dismissing biodiversity. We're dismissing neurodiversity. We're dismissing what it is to be human and different and diverse and... Yeah, the screen thing is always one of the top questions I get. Yeah. Yep, that's right. I mean, skills are important, learning is important. However, PDAs are largely autodidactic, so which really equates to being intelligent and intuitive, which means that we follow follow our passions, follow something that we're interested in, learn about it that way. Instead of being one, in, one of many sitting at a table learning what we're told, when we're told and how we're told. I mean, that very thought to me is just... I can't cope with it. I can't. And I think it's great that some people can and enjoy that. But I can't, I can't deal with that. And that's not because I think I'm better than anybody. It's not because I'm less intelligent. It's not because I'm insubordinate. It's because I have a PDA autistic expression. I was born that way and there's purpose within that. So when you take a person who is a PDA, there is a natural sense of leadership in there. There is a natural sense of timelessness, passion, creativity. We're not channeling our children's gifts. We're not channeling what's positive and wonderful about our children. We're focusing on society's perceived deficits. And I think it's incredibly sad that as parents we buy into that. I think it's incredibly sad that as parents we believe that. We go, okay, they can't show up for school every day like everybody else in the world, so this is terrible. This is absolutely terrible, you know? When I'm on my deathbed as a parent, am I going to be focused on the fact that a couple of my girls didn't attend a mainstream school or am I going to be you know living with a sense of gratitude that we had the most beautiful connections at the end of the day what matters most what is life about and then of course when I'm saying this I'm remembering that there is a characteristic written about autistic people that we tend not to focus on the smaller details, but the bigger picture. That's a beautiful thing. It's a really beautiful thing because the bigger picture is what matters. What really matters at the end of the day. Anyway, I'm going to sign off. I love seeing people connecting in the comment section, sharing experiences and answering questions together. I love this and I love that it's done in a respectful way. And I think the questions are great. Becky, Becky Pine. I think I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Becky. So, PDA is not a diagnosis, it's an identification. So often um, you would have an assessment for autism and it might be recognised as autism with um, pathological demand avoidance. But you'd need to go to a very specific person for that. A lot of professionals say that they understand PDA, but my experience has been that they don't. Any other questions 
before I go. Hi Tim. Tim, it's so great to have you here and to connect in real time. Thanks for being here. Sarah, yes, we do get to decide what really matters. These are our lives. These are our lives. We don't make the decision to have children just to bring them into the world to enforce mainstream life onto them. What about who a person is? Yeah, I'll just finish on this. So a lot of families are sharing that at the moment they're seeing um, an incredible change during lockdown in their young PDA and that might be that their mental health has improved. However, they may be more demand avoidant. And a lot of people are making the assumption that lockdown could only be good for PDAs. But I want to remind people of this. Demands aren't just spoken demands. They're implied expectations and implied demands. And that neurobiological response, that PDA brain, is on to everything. It picks up things, like I've said before, that we don't consciously think of. So lockdown is a great example usually when we're young we can go to our parents and we can negotiate to get something done or to get something we need or want when there's been a rule put in place or a restriction lockdown is an example of not being able to do that so we can't even go to our parents and negotiate being able to do something so our neurobiology has um, caught on to the fact that there is this sanction in place, that there is this restriction in place that applies to everybody and there's no getting out of it. That is an incredible restriction, an incredible compromise to our autonomy and freedom. So if you are seeing your child uh, more demand avoidance, spending more time in their room, then that might be why. Um, because the root, the inherent being of a PDA is a profound drive for autonomy and freedom. And when that is compromised in any way, that is when the anxiety shows up. Harry, are you still here? I thought you'd taken off. I thought you were triggered and left for the day. Yeah, I think, Kate, that that's very common when we have a break from something that isn't easy ordinarily. We're communicating directly to the brain that we're resting. And so it's hard to get back into that space again. Peeing makes me angry, Sinead. It's a demand. Even our body telling us when I feel hungry, sometimes I feel annoyed about it. I feel annoyed that it's not on my terms. I feel annoyed because I didn't consciously make the decision to be hungry. So I feel like my autonomy is compromised. Going to the bathroom needing a shower, being hungry, all those things, depending on what I'm doing at the time, but I find them so annoying. So annoying. This is definitely my longest life. Oh my God, I've been talking for 50 minutes. Okay, I'm going. This is too much. Sorry, I've been away for a few days and so I'm kind of making up for it now. Yes, interception is a big one for me. 
fern. It's really important to talk about. Okay. Bye.